In this chapter, we will learn about hypothesis testing, and this lesson will focus on the basics. In chapters 2 and 3, we used descriptive statistics when we summarized data using tools such as graphs and statistics such as the mean and standard deviation. Methods of inferential statistics use sample data to make an inference or conclusion about a population. The two main activities of inferential statistics are using sample data to 1. Estimate a population parameter, such as estimating a population parameter with a confidence interval, and 2. Test a hypothesis or claim about a population parameter. In Chapter 7, we presented methods for estimating a population parameter with a confidence interval, and in this chapter, we present the method of hypothesis testing. The main objective of this chapter is to develop the ability to conduct hypothesis tests for claims made about a population proportion p, a population mean mu, or a population standard deviation sigma. Here are some examples of hypotheses that can be tested. Genetics. The Genetics and IVF Institute claims that its XSORT method allows couples to increase the probability of having a baby girl. Business. A newspaper cites a PriceGrabber.com survey of 1,631 subjects and claims that a majority have heard of the Kindle as an ebook reader. Health. It is often claimed that the mean body temperature is 98.6 degrees. We can test this claim using a sample of 106 temperatures with a mean of 98.2 degrees. When conducting hypothesis tests as described in this chapter and the following chapters, instead of jumping directly to procedures and calculations, be sure to consider the context of the data, the source of the data, and the sampling method used to obtain the sample data. Now let's look at some definitions. A hypothesis is a claim or statement about a property of a population. A hypothesis test is a procedure for testing a claim about a property of a population. The methods presented in this chapter to test a hypothesis are based on the rare event rule. If, under a given assumption, the probability of a particular observed event is exceptionally small, we conclude that the assumption is probably not correct. So, we're trying to determine whether the results reported by a claim come from just chance or were the results highly unlikely to occur by chance. We will be using the following steps to set up a test for a claim. First, identify the claim. Second, set up the null and alternative hypotheses in symbolic form. Third, calculate a test statistic using the appropriate formula. Four, identify the p-value or identify the critical values. Five, find alpha from the significance level, and six, state the conclusion about a claim in simple and non-technical terms. Now let's look at each step of the hypothesis test procedure in more detail. So the hypothesis. We have a null hypothesis and its symbol is H sub zero. The null hypothesis is a hypothesis which the researcher tries to disprove, reject, or nullify. The null often refers to the common view of something, while the alternative hypothesis is what the researcher really thinks is the cause of a phenomenon. The null hypothesis, denoted by H sub zero, is a statement that the value of a population parameter, such as a proportion, mean, or standard deviation, is equal to some claimed value. We test the null hypothesis directly in the sense that we assume it is true 
and reach a conclusion to either reject it or fail to reject it. The alternative hypothesis denoted by H sub 1 or H sub A is the statement that a parameter has a value that somehow differs from the null hypothesis. The symbolic form of the alternative hypothesis must use one of these symbols, less than, greater than, or not equal. The null hypothesis is always equal. The alternate is not. When writing the hypothesis, use P if the problem involves a claim about a proportion. Use mu if the problem involves a claim about the mean. The test statistic, Z or T, when comparing proportions, use Z. Z is equal to P hat minus P divided by the square root of P times Q divided by N. When comparing means with a known standard deviation sigma, use z equals x bar minus mu divided by sigma divided by the square root of n. When comparing means with an unknown standard deviation sigma, use t equals x bar minus mu divided by s divided by the square root of n. The significance level denoted by alpha is the probability that a test statistic will fall in the critical region when the null hypothesis is actually true, making the mistake of rejecting the null hypothesis when it is true. This is the same alpha introduced in section 7.2 when we studied confidence interval estimates. Common choices for alpha are 0 0.05, 0 0.01, and 0 0.10. The tails in a distribution are the extreme regions bounded by critical values. Determinations of p-values and critical values are affected by whether a critical region is in two tails, a left tail or a right tail. It is very important to correctly characterize a hypothesis test as being two-tailed, left-tailed, or right-tailed. The number of tails is determined by the claim if the claim is less than, we'll have a left-tailed test. If the claim is greater than, we'll have a right-tailed test. If the claim is about equality, then we have a two-tailed test. Here's a picture of a normal distribution curve drawn for a hypothesis test involving two tails. Notice that the null hypothesis H sub 0 is always equal but the alternative h sub 1 has a not equals in it. So it's a claim involving equality. That generates a two-tailed test. In a left-tailed test, we had a claim involving less than. So our alternative hypothesis had the less than symbol in it, so we have a left-tailed test. If our test statistic that we calculate falls in the left tail, we make the conclusion to reject the null. If it doesn't fall in that critical region of the left tail, then we make the conclusion to fail to reject the null. Going back, if we have a two-tailed test, then we have two critical regions located in the two extreme tails. If our test statistic falls in those two critical regions, we would reject the null. If it falls in the blue region, we fail to reject the null. In a right-tailed test, the alternative hypothesis has a claim about greater than. If our test statistic falls in the red critical region in the greater than tail, we reject the null. If it doesn't, then we fail to reject the null. The p-value or probability value is the probability of getting a value of the test statistic that is at least as extreme as the one representing the sample data, assuming that the null hypothesis is true. 
So in the critical region in the left tail, the p-value is equal to the area to the left of the test statistic. If we have a right-tailed test, the p-value is equal to the area to the right of the test statistic. And if we have a two-tailed test, the p-value is equal to twice the area in the tail beyond the test statistic. So many times we'll find the area in one tail and we double it to find the area in both. Here's a flow chart that shows the procedure for finding p-values. So you can reference this in your notes later. The critical region or rejection region is the set of all values of the test statistic that calls us to reject the null. For example, see the red shaded region in the previous figures. A critical value is any value that separates the critical region where we reject the null hypothesis from the values of the test statistic that do not lead to rejection of the null hypothesis. The critical values depend on the nature of the null hypothesis, the sampling distribution that applies, and the significance level alpha. The methodologies depend on if you are using the p-value method or the critical value method. So we will be focusing on the p-value method first. With a p-value method, we will be using the significance level alpha, and if the p-value is less than or equal to alpha, we decide to reject the null. If the p-value is greater than alpha, we fail to reject the null. With the critical value method, if the test statistic falls within the critical region of the tail, we re reject the null. If the test statistic does not fall within the critical region of the tail, we fail to reject the null. Finally, we must state a final conclusion that addresses the original claim with wording that can be understood by those without knowledge of statistical procedures. Your final conclusion is not to reject the null or fail to reject the null. Use this flowchart to help when wording the final conclusion. So we start by asking the question, does the original claim contain, contain the addition of equal condition of equality. So if our original claim said p is equal to 0.5, then we would say yes, the original claim contains equality. And then we would follow this here. Did we reject the null? If we said yes, we reject the null, then our wording starts with the statement there is sufficient evidence to warrant rejection of the claim that, and here you'll reword the original claim. If we have a claim of equality but we fail to reject the null, then we say there is not sufficient evidence to warrant rejection of the claim that, and we restate the claim here. What if our claim does not contain equality? So what if our claim said p was, le was greater than 0.5, or maybe it could say p is less than 0.5, or even it could say not equal, so that situation would also be included here. Then we would say no, the original claim does not contain equality and becomes the alternative hypothesis. Did we reject the null? If we said yes, then we say the sample data support the claim that, and we state the claim. If we fail to reject the null, then we say there is not sufficient sample evidence to support the claim that. Never conclude a hypothesis test with a statement of reject the null hypothesis or fail to reject the null hypothesis. Always make sense of the conclusion with a statement that uses simple non-technical wording that addresses the original claim. A type 1 error is the mistake of rejecting the null hypothesis when it is actually true. The symbol alpha is used to represent the probability of a type 1 error. 
A type 2 error is the mistake of failing to reject the null hypothesis when it is actually false. The symbol beta is used to represent the probability of a type 2 error. So here's a chart that just organizes the uh, different errors um, and the correct decisions that should be made here. So what I want to bring up is just an example of type 1 errors and type 2 errors. So let's say that our claim is that a man is guilty. So I'm the prosecutor and I'm claiming that this man is guilty. So my null hypothesis would state the man is guilty because the null hypothesis is always equal. The alternative hypothesis must be different. So I would be the opposite of that and I would say the man is not guilty. So my alternative would have to be different, not equal. So let's say that the null is true, so he is guilty, but we reject it. So we say he is not guilty. So if we reject it, then we're saying that he's not guilty, but what if that was actually true? What if he really was guilty? So that's an example of an error, and that's the error where we let an innocent man go free. Another type of error could occur where the null is false. So really he's not guilty, but during the trial they find and conclude that he is. So in that case, we fail to reject the null and we're putting a guilty man in prison. So for any fixed alpha, here are some ways to control a type 1 error. We can increase the sample size n and that will cause a decrease in beta. For any fixed sample size n, if we decrease alpha, it will cause an increase in beta. Conversely, an increase in alpha will cause a decrease in beta. So to decrease both of those errors, we want to increase our sample size.